Good morning and welcome to this session on uh, the, U the U.S. And, and Iran. There's no need for me to make any introductory remarks to frame the discussion. We couldn't have had a better framing than with the two um, keynote uh, addresses that we had this morning. So I also think that you all know or have in your uh, conference paperwork who our speakers are. I'm not going to waste a lot of time in introducing them. Uh, both uh, Kazan and then Michael will, be, will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll try and open up to a discussion and hopefully have significant time to get deeper into the issues. Kazan, please. Well, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. I just want to preface my talk by saying in defense of Ambassador Qasem Sajidpour that he and I are not related. Um, I'm Karim Sajidpour, not Qasem. And when I was based many years ago with the International Crisis Group, he was gracious enough to give me my very first interview when I was living in Tehran. And at that time, um, Ambassador Sajidpour may, may recall, at that time in 2003, my, my roommate in Tehran was my 90-year-old grandmother. And when I told her I was going to see someone called Ambassador Sajidpour, she said to me, you must ask him whether he is from the town of Arak, where my grandfather is from. And so when I went to go visit him, that was the very first question I asked him. I said, Ambassador Sajidpour, do you happen to be from Arak? And he said, no, I'm from Shiraz. And so then we, I, we got into uh, political questions. And so when I went home, my grandmother was very adamant. She said, did you ask him whether he was from Arak? And I said, I did, in fact. He, he said he was from Shia, he was not from Arak. And she, I said, you know, wh why was that so important to me, to you? And she said, well, thank God. I thought your grandfather had been up to no good. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. So I thought what I'll do is, is open up very broadly, not all of you, I think for those of you who live in Washington, my remarks won't be revelatory, uh, but for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with Washington, I'll just make some four or five broad points and then hand it over to Mike. Uh, the first point I'd make is that very early in Trump's presidency, there was an article by someone at the Brookings Institute called Ben Wittes. And I thought he had the most incisive four words to describe Trump's domestic policy. And he described it as malevolence tempered by incompetence. And if I had to describe Trump's Iran policy in four words, I'd say it's belligerence coupled with incoherence. And I say not tempered by incoherence because in some ways the incoherence of the Trump administration's belligerence um, has not tempered its policy. It's in some ways accentuated its dangers. Now, I see personally three poles to the Trump administration's Iran policy. As Ambassador Armitage talked about this morning, I think the first poll is obviously President Trump, who very clearly wants a deal with Iran, which is he's far more focused uh, on the process rather than the outcome. I think he really is just interested in a pageant along the lines of what he's had with Kim Jong-un in Singapore. So he's very clearly not interested in conflict. He doesn't care about democracy or human rights, given his friendship with folks like Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin. He's really interested in a deal, um, if not just a pageant. So you have President Trump on one end of the spectrum. At the polar opposite end of the spectrum, you have his national security advisor, John Bolton. And I would argue never in modern history has there ever been a greater discrepancy between the worldview of a president and his national security advisor in that John Bolton has a three-decade history of advocating for conflict and military strikes and regime change in Iran. And I think um, uh, Bolton's uh, approach is very clear. It's to exact enough pressure on Iran to either force its, the regime's capitulation or implosion. So you have Trump and Bolton on polar opposite ends. And in between them, you have Secretary of State Pompeo. And I think what Pompeo is essentially trying to do is reconcile the impulses of Trump with the strategy of Bolton. And I use the word 
Trump's impulses specifically, because I think he really acts on impulse um, more than he does any, um, uh, you know, more, more than he, he, he thinks about a uh, strategy uh, in, in a cohesive way. And the way Pompeo has, has, has focused, has, has tried to reconcile these um, contradictory approaches is to really focus on the means rather than the ends. And the means is economic pressure and, and sanctions rather than fo focusing on an ends in which um, th there's not a, a common agreement in Washington. And so what is the danger of this approach? In my opinion, the biggest danger of Trump's approach is not that we're heading towards another uh, Iraq war, a la Iraq in 2003, a major um, regime change operation which could cause the death of hundreds of thousands of people. I think the, the, the more realistic danger is an inadvertent collision, uh, a miscalculation between the two sides. And I think what, what Trump has done very dangerously is he simultaneously provoked an escalatory cycle with Iran while also making it clear to Tehran and to the world that he's averse to conflict and he believes that his uh, re-election campaign um, would be significantly weakened by another conflict in the Middle East and with Iran. And I think the danger of that approach is that he's inadvertently sent a signal to Tehran um, that they can get away with some free punches because the you know, American president is not interested in encountering them. And for that reason, you've seen over the course of the last two, three months, um, Iran, um, you know, going after uh, third-party tankers, uh, even shooting down a U.S. drone. And so far, there haven't really been meaningful consequences for that. And I think the danger is that Iran will continue to, to punch back at the United States. And at some point, a red line will be crossed, which could then hasten some type of a collision. Now, the... the um, I'm trying to read my own handwriting here. So I think that um, the, the, the challenge which Iran's supreme leader faces is the fact that, in my opinion, the status quo uh, really suits the United States far more than Iran. Because uh, for the most part, the escalation with Iran hasn't impacted the lives of most Americans. Whereas if, if, you, if you heard this morning, uh, the, the, the sanctions against Iran have had terrible consequences for the population of Iran. And it's going to be virtually impossible for Iran to reverse its economic deterioration absent some type of an accommodation with the United States. So the status quo at the moment, I think really plays to US interests far more than Iranian interests. I think the challenge and the dilemma that Iran's supreme leader faces is that he validly, is, is validly concerned that if he uh, show signs of compromise under pressure, it's not going to strengthen the argument of the doves in Washington who are arguing for a more conciliatory approach, but on the contrary, it's going to strengthen the argument of the likes of Bolton, who say, you see, the pressure is working. Let's turn the heat up rather than turn the heat off. And so for that reason, I think the Supreme Leader um, has, has valid concerns uh, about coming to the negotiating table. And I'll conclude with a, a couple remarks about what I see as kind of the broad challenges of US policy and Iran, not just now, but over the course of the last several decades. And one of the paradoxes you see in Iran is you have a regime whose worst elements resemble North Korea. They prioritize militarization, nuclearization, isolation. And you have a society whose majority elements, I would argue, aspire to be like South Korea. They want to be integrated and prosperous. And I think the challenge of US policy toward Iran over the last several decades is that to prevent Iran from becoming like North Korea has required economic and political isolation. But to help Iran help the society become like South Korea requires economic and political engagement and integration. And these policies are really at loggerheads because in some ways to try to prevent Iran from North Korea that isolation and sanctions has, I would argue, perhaps been more of a carrot to a stick than Iran's most hardline forces, to Iran's most hardline forces because they've actually thrived in isolation.
And, you know, challenge, I, I, I think one of the, the, the natures of the challenge is, is the nature of the U.S. system, whereby uh, a member of the House looks at the world in two-year increments, uh, presidential administrations look at the world in four-year increments, and senators look at the world in six-year increments. Because um, I've shared this analysis with many of them over the years, and they would say, listen, can you guarantee us that if we engage Iran or try to integrate Iran, that in the next two, four, or six years that that's going to bring about a uh, major change in Iran? Will that turn, help turn Iran into South Korea? And you say, of course not. You know, that's an unpredictable path that could take another generation or two. And so their response is, well, then in the near term, our immediate concerns are to counter Iran's regional activities, to counter its, its, its nuclear activities. And the focus is much more tactical and short term rather than long term and strategic. But at the same time, I think we should be clear that the U.S.-Iran conflict, the U.S.-Iran Cold War, is not a morality play, a Shakespearean morality play between the forces of good and the forces of evil. The United States has certainly made many mistakes over the years vis-a-vis um, -vis Iran. Um, but, but at the same time, Iran's uh, economic condition uh, I would argue, is, has been far more uh, uh, hindered by the country's internal corruption, um, mismanagement, and repressure than it has any foreign pressure. And the best example uh, of that in some ways, certainly of the repression, is the imprisonment of a uh, U.S. citizen by the name of Siam Namazi, who was, in my opinion, one of the most articulate opponents of the damages of economic sanctions, and he's been languishing in prison in Iran for almost the last four years. And so uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's incorrect um, to believe that, that uh, what's holding Iran back is solely external pressure. I think, above all, uh, Iran has been hindered by remarkable mismanagement uh, and, and, and corruption. And, and whenever I'm in a place like Singapore, and you know, especially you know, considering the the remarkable leadership of, of someone like Lee Kuan Yew, you know, I always think that um, Iran is a country which could really be a major global player, including a major global economic player. It has the economic resources, the natural resources, energy resources, and above all, the human re resources to be a major player. Um, but instead of trying to fulfill its enormous potential as a nation state and drill into the, 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 the enormous capacity of its people, I think it's been far more focused on being a regional spoiler rather than a global player. And so this is one of the, the, the hopes I think that all of us have for Iran is that you, know, you will soon see a leadership in the country which prioritizes the country's national interests before its revolutionary ideology. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Curry, Michael. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me start by saying uh, happy 54th birthday. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I consider myself a longtime friend of Singapore, but this is actually the first time I've ever been to Singapore, and so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also a real pleasure to see so many friends uh, in the room here, people I've known for a long time. It's an honor to speak after Secretary Armitage. Um, I, in part because I was a special assistant to Colin Powell when I was uh, younger, uh, when, when Secretary Armitage was Deputy Secretary of State, which left me with a real healthy respect for the experience he brings to these issues. Uh, and experience is something which I think is valued in this part of the world, uh, but unfortunately undervalued in Washington, uh, especially now. Um, I, I want to just briefly talk about the past, the present, the future of U.S. policy towards Iran. That sounds like a really long speech, and I promise it won't be uh, it won't be too long. I'm going to be uh, sort of skate over the surface of these issues and hopefully we'll have a chance in the Q&A to delve into these issues a bit more. You know, in a sense, I think everyone here and in the rest of the world is suffering through what is really the extension of a domestic debate in the United States over the JCPOA, over the Iran nuclear agreement. Because I, I think everyone here will recall that in 2015, um, we had far from a bipartisan consensus on the JCPOA. Um, there was strong criticism, strong opposition, there were strong supporters of the deal. And the critics were largely in the Republican Party, um, and their criticisms really focused on three things. Um, number one, there was a view that the, the nuclear deal didn't do enough to restrict Iran's ability to produce nuclear weapons in the future. That it didn't really force Iran to choose between 
having the option to make a nuclear weapon and getting relief from sanctions. Um, second, there was a view that the deal should have been more comprehensive, that it should have also addressed the other um, issues uh, of concern for the United States with Iran, in part because uh, the sort of U.S. side of the deal, the U.S. concession, was comprehensive, near comprehensive sanctions relief, which would really limit our ability to respond to those other issues. And then the third criticism was that this was a temporary deal, that it was sort of kicking the can down the road. And whether you think it was useful to buy time uh, or dangerous to give Iran time often determined where you stood on the deal. But because these were the Republican criticisms, it really shouldn't have come as much surprise that when a Republican president came into office, um, he was determined to uh, do something else with this, to tear it up, to change it, uh, and so forth. And my own view is that any Republican president coming to office probably would have opposed the JCPOA. Would they have withdrawn from it? I don't know. But we would have seen a push to change it in some way, to change the status quo. Especially because, as I think has already been mentioned, in that intervening year, that last year of the Obama administration, really there was no progress in any other area of U.S.-Iran relations, quite the opposite. In fact, things got worse, arguably. So I see President Trump's decision to withdraw, in other words, sort of how we got to where we are now, as based not just on politics. Politics was surely part of it. I mean, as Secretary Armand had said, this was President Obama's signature foreign policy achievement um, from the Democratic point of view, um, and therefore perhaps uh, part of the reason why President Trump opposes it. But I think it was also a disagreement over substance between Republicans and Democrats especially. Um, but then also, one other issue I want to bring into it was there was a sense of opportunity, I think, in the United States. Some people have questioned, some people, uh, I, I imagine even in the audience, wonder, well, if you don't like the deal, um, why get out of it now? I think the answer to that for the Trump administration was not just that Iran would be able to build up its nuclear capabilities over time, but that conditions now were particularly conducive to trying to use pressure against Iran to get a better deal because of, for example, oil market conditions, which we talked about uh, a little earlier. So I, so I think there were sort of those three reasons why the Trump administration, why President Trump withdrew from this deal. And that sort of brings us to where we are now. I, I do agree with Kareem that there is a real debate within the administration over what our objective towards Iran should be. Um, and I think that breaks down around several, several lines. Amongst those who believe we should seek a deal with Iran, and this includes President Trump, who I would argue is the most important voice uh, on this issue, even if he's not terribly engaged day to day on it. There are those who think we should just get a better nuclear deal. That seems to be where the president is. If you look at what he says about it, what he tweets about it, um, there is a sense that we need a better nuclear deal than the JCPOA. There are others who would say, no, we need a grand bargain with Iran, a comprehensive agreement. Um, Secretary Pompeo, uh, in his uh, speech a couple years ago about Iran, listed 12 demands that the United States had of Iran, and they basically broke down into three categories, nuclear and missiles on the one hand, terrorism uh, on the second hand, and on the third hand, I don't have three hands, but on my third finger, we'll say, um, regional issues, Iran's involvement in places like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and so forth. Then there are those who advocate regime change. And in a sense, you could argue that those who are advocating for regime change and those who are argue, arguing for a grand bargain are not necessarily different camps, because it raises the question of, could you have a US-Iran grand bargain um, under the current political configuration we see in Iran? I personally am skeptical uh, of that point. Then there are those who would say, we don't need a deal at all, that really our objective should be to contain and deter Iran uh, over time until there's some change that happens in Iran itself, and we should let that change happen uh, organically uh, or endogenously, as it were. So you have this debate over objectives. What you see less of, though, is debate over strategy. Uh, the Trump administration, as I think everyone here knows, has this so-called maximum pressure strategy. Well, the thing about maximum pressure is it can really serve any of these ends. So you don't need to agree on the objective to agree on the strategy, on maximum pressure. Um, it can deliver uh, a better deal uh, for those who believe in it. Um, it could also potentially destabilize Iran and deliver regime change for those who believe in that. Um, and it is, I think, part of these days for the Trump administration, the standard playbook for the United States. It's the same approach that the US took towards North Korea before the, the Kim-Trump summit. Um, it's the same approach the United States has taken towards China, negotiating while raising pressure uh, on China through tariffs. Uh, it's the same approach that, you know, Secretary Armitage mentioned NAFTA. It's the same approach the U.S. took towards Mexico and Canada, uh, two friends of the United States, raising tariffs uh, 
um, while looking for a better deal. And so it's, uh, uh, so it's part of that sort of standard playbook the Trump administration has used in multiple cases. I would say, though, that maximum pressure, maximum sanctions pressure, which is really what it means, also reflects something else, which is uh, maybe indicative of where the United States is right now with respect to the Middle East. This is action from a distance. It sort of reflects the United States' reluctance to get too engaged in the Middle East, whether through diplomacy or through military intervention, and allows us to exercise instead the tremendous financial power we have in the world um, while not really getting our hands dirty in the issue, if you know what I mean. Um, and in the wake of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, wars that are actually still going on, um, that's something which is, I think, attractive to folks on both the right and the left, frankly, even though there's a lot of disagreement over the policy. I will say, just as an aside, that as we think about what are the risks of this policy for a country like Singapore or other trading partners in the world, when we use these sanctions uh, against not just Iran, but Russia, China, North Korea, and elsewhere, I don't think we have thought too much, and Secretary Armitage alluded to this, we, I don't think we have thought too much about the systemic risks that creates of sort of carving out a part of the world um, and saying this part of the world is essentially cut off from the economy of the rest of the world um, by U.S. policy. Um, I think that does pose a lot of complications and risks for countries like Singapore and our other trading partners around the world. Um, but I digress because that's a, a bigger and different issue, separate issue. The other element of the strategy, though, besides maximum pressure, comes down to the JCPOA itself. Um, before uh, the last round of sanctions were put in place, um, you saw this situation where Iran was sticking with the JCPOA despite the U.S. sanctions. Now, that sort of, I think, could look to many from the outside as sort of the U.S. having our cake and eating it, too. Right? It's sort of the best of both worlds. Uh, Iran complies with the agreement. We ramp up sanctions in hopes for a better agreement. But I think for many who are um, currently making policy, that actually wasn't seen as a good situation because there's a desire not just to take the U.S. out of the JCPOA, but to clear the JCPOA off the books entirely so that no future administration could return to the agreement, to essentially press the reset button um, and start from scratch. Um, and in a sense, therefore, Iran's actions to move away from the JCPOA uh, helped to fulfill that particular desire. I would say that, from my point of view, from, from where I sort of sat in Washington, Iran's response um, until recently looked like trying to wait out the Trump administration, to say, we'll just defy the sanctions, resist the sanctions, um, at least until November of 2020, to see if there's a political change in the United States. And I think the US decision to bring Iran down to zero oil exports, to attempt to do that, is what has really now changed the game. Um, and I, my, my own sense is that Iran has decided it can no longer simply wait out the Trump administration, but needs to push back on the U.S. policy. And the two areas where Iran clearly perceives leverage are nuclear escalation, and we have seen this sort of incremental noncompliance with the JCPOA uh, in so far relatively small ways, and regional escalation, where my own view is that Tehran believes that it has greater risk tolerance than the United States, a greater willingness, again, to sort of engage uh, in sort of uh, military action within the region itself than the United States has. And this leaves the United States, I think, with a conundrum, with a problem, which is that sanctions, maximum pressure, take time to work, if they work at all. Whereas the crisis that we're seeing now is moving very quickly and could move even more quickly. Um, and that puts, obviously, the United States in a bit of a bind. So where do we go from here, just looking at the future? Uh, and very briefly, I think for the United States, there's two big risks. One is the risk of military conflict. Um, we've talked about, does the United States want war or not? I agree with um, uh, my colleagues who have spoken. I don't think President Trump wants war, but I think, ironically, um, the fact that everyone knows he doesn't want a war, that Iran knows that specifically, um, gives Iran an incentive to escalate further against the United States, sort of by trial and error, trying to find that U.S. red line. Um, and I think that's a very dangerous business, um, especially because I think President Trump is probably more unpredictable than Iran may calculate. The second risk, I think, is that Iran simply continues to really wait out this policy while incrementally escalating its nuclear activities. And that means that President Trump, in theory, could leave office handing to his successor not just an unsettled situation, uh, but an Iranian nuclear program which is more advanced than the one that he inherited, in a sense. 
um, which is obviously not the objective that he had coming in. Uh, to be sure, there's big risk for Iran and the world as well. I'm happy to talk more about those in the Q&A. But, uh, but to talk now about what can the U.S. do to mitigate these risks that we face. Well, my advice uh, to the Trump administration has been that there needs to be really three characteristics for a successful policy towards Iran. It has to be comprehensive. In other words, rely not just on a single policy tool, sanctions, um, but rely on all of the policy tools we have, which means that if you're going to sort of engage in this type of confrontational policy, you have to be willing to use deterrence to push back uh, on the types of actions we're seeing from Iran. Um, you have to also be using to be, will, be willing to use diplomacy with Iran, uh, to offer Iran, for example, talks at the working level um, to address American concerns. Uh, and so far, we haven't been willing to do either of those things. Second, the policy needs to be multilateral. The reality is, and I think um, this is true between the U.S. and Singapore, it's true between the U.S. and Europe, uh, as well as our other Asian allies, that there's more that the U.S. and our allies agree about when it comes to concerns about Iran's behavior than that we disagree about. And yet our conversations on the issue have been dominated by our disagreements rather than trying to take advantage of that convergence over, for example, our concerns about Iran's regional activities, our concerns about uh, security uh, in the Persian Gulf. Had we decided to take that issue as our starting point, security in the Persian Gulf, rather than our disagreement over the JCPOA two years ago, then I think we would have had actually a much greater chance of building a coalition to uh, provide maritime security in the region, which maybe would have been more effective than where we are today. But still, I think we need to look for opportunities to tap into that agreement. Third, I think it needs to be sustainable. So comprehensive, multilateral, and sustainable. Which means that if you're going to use sanctions, and I think sanctions can be part of a successful American policy, um, you have to be careful not to provoke a crisis, because if you provoke a crisis, the ability of your sanctions to deliver anything, I think, becomes uh, much less. Just one last note before uh, I um, sit down. And that's the question of how does this issue relate to the overall U.S. strategy, which now focuses on what we're calling great power competition. Now, you can agree or disagree that that should be the U.S. strategy, uh, but it's gained a lot of currency in Washington, both on the right and the left. The idea that we need to focus on the threats from uh, large powers like Russia uh, and China and the competition um, that could be ahead of us with those powers. It's not clear exactly how the Middle East fits into great power competition. Um, is it a distraction from it or like in the past will it be a sort of theater for it? Um, but what's clear to me at least is that the United States has been so active in the Middle East really for two reasons. One, we have clear interests there, whether that's energy, counterterrorism, uh, free flow of uh, navigation and so forth. Second, there really is no one else in the region that can competently secure those interests for us. Israel maybe is an exception, but Israel's a small country. Ultimately, there's only so much it can do. But we have no Japan, we have no Singapore, we have no South Korea or Australia in the Middle East. Uh, we have allies whose capacity and, and whose willingness, frankly, to act is relatively low. That means the United States needs to try to walk a tightrope in the Middle East if it's really going to focus on um, these other areas of the world. We need to avoid allowing our strategy to be derailed by getting sucked into a war in the Middle East. Again, that would be disastrous for our overall strategy. And yet we have to still take care of those interests that we have in the region. We can't pretend as though we don't have them or simply turn away from them. So we need to find that middle ground. And if you ask me, that middle ground is really going to be found by relying on, uh, to a much greater extent than we have, diplomacy, deterrence, and allies. Uh, and so I'll just end by... Um, thanking Singapore for being such a good ally, and hopefully we'll be a good ally back uh, as we look forward. Thank you, Michael. Before I open a, uh, this up to the floor for questions, I want to revert back to both of you. Um, you. You were very clear and very explicit in terms of answering the first question that guides this panel which is what are U.S. goals, and you've referred to in terms of the maximum pressure, but to put it point blank in terms of the second question that's guiding this panel, do you expect uh, maximum pressure to succeed? In other words, do you expect it to change Iranian behavior? Uh, 
So I, I, I'm not optimistic it's going to change Iran's regional behavior because Iran's regional behavior has been fairly consistent for about four decades and it hasn't changed whether the U.S. has tried to engage or coerce Iran. I'm also not optimistic that it's going to bring about what Mike talked about, either a grand bargain or a JCPOA 2.0 for the reason that I stated earlier, which is if you're sitting in Tehran and you're the supreme leader, I think you have valid concerns that if you start to show signs of compromise in response to this pressure, it's not going to strengthen those who say, let's be conciliatory towards Iran. It's going to strengthen Bolton's argument that you see the pressure is now working, so let's turn the heat up more. And so, you know, the Iranians read the newspapers just like we do. And when you read the newspaper, you see examples. For example, um, in the Washington Post a couple months ago, there was a piece about how Trump is getting very impatient with his Venezuela policy and that he's losing patience with the campaign to, to get rid of Maduro and he's starting to question Bolton's approach. And so if you're the Iranians and you read that, you simply say, let's continue to resist and continue to relent. And this is a president who has attention deficit disorder. He can't focus, uh, he's not strategic. And after two, three months, he may lose confidence and patience with Bolton's strategy and, 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 and perhaps take a different approach. So, so I, I, I am skeptical that it's going to lead to a, a JCPOA 2.0. That said, I also don't see how Iran can reverse this economic deterioration absent some type of an accommodation. And so it's a, it's a question, what is going to break first, you know, Iran's pride or its economy? And as Mike was saying, I think they initially believed, Tehran initially believed that it could simply wait till November 2020. Now it's, you know, it's not, it's not clear um, whether, you know, they can even hope for a one-term Trump presidency. And so one of the challenging things about this issue is that I can draw for you a couple dozen different scenarios of how this is going to lead to a collision. It's very difficult to draw a plausible scenario of how this leads to um, a, a negotiated outcome. So I'll just be brief because I don't, I don't fundamentally disagree with Kareem. I think maximum pressure has already changed Iran's behavior. It's not in the way that we would like it to change. Um, because the, what, a lot of what we're seeing now, the nuclear escalation, the regional escalation, is I think the Iranian response to that pressure. And the real question I think that's pertinent for American policymakers is, is that simply an attempt to push the United States back um, to deter us? Or is it a prelude to uh, Iran being willing to come to the table, to say build up some leverage of its own and then come into a negotiation, which is what the Trump administration wants. And I don't know the answer to that. It could be either, frankly. Is it going to, is sanctions pressure in general, uh, or any other kind of pressure, military pressure, um, diplomatic isolation, going to deliver a sort of thoroughgoing strategic shift in Iran's behavior? I'm skeptical. I think that would require Iran itself, um, either because of political change or something else, to decide that it wants to change its strategy. Because I think that what you see from Iran in the region, um, from in its nuclear program, in its missile program, is a sort of um, uh, coherent national security strategy, one which I think uh, is um, damaging, frankly, for the region and for Iran itself, but one which is coherent. So they would need something to replace it. Um, my own view is that if Iran, if, if you get a, a result out of all this, either under the Trump administration or, say, a Democratic president, uh, if one follows President Trump, if, if Iran believes that it can keep that same strategy um, of doing what it's doing in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and so forth, um, doing what it, it tends to do in the Persian Gulf, while having sort of good economic relations with the world, I think that's a fantasy, personally. And so there's a dilemma there for Iran as well, which is if it sees its future as sanctions relief, trading with the world, and so forth, um, that's incompatible, I think, with this very sort of confrontational strategy that's adopted in the region. Um, so there's a dilemma for both sides. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the floor. As, as in previous uh, sessions, please identify yourself. Please ask a short question. Don't give us long speeches. We have roughly 30 minutes, and I'll take two or 
three questions at the same time. Brian. Brian Shaker from the UAE SPC. Um, the other stakeholders, the GCPOA, the European Union, the permanent members of the Security Council, like Germany, uh, are they completely important? Or is there just no uh, will on their part to try and find a solution to the problem? I know there's a lot of frustration. The GCPOA is still actually a valid agreement, albeit the Americans are out. Your comment on this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, you think of a question. Let me let me uh, allow Karim and Michael to answer this one. So I, I think that, so the question was, are the other members of the P5 plus one, the other stakeholders in the agreement, um, powerless to uh, do anything at this stage? I think the answer is, unfortunately, they're, they're largely powerless. Because if you look at the way the JCPOA is structured, the bargain is that Iran engages um, in some measure of um, restraint in its nuclear activities for specified periods of time. And what it gets in return is sanctions relief. And because of the American power in the global financial system, um, the United States, through secondary sanctions, has the ability, as we are currently demonstrating, to frustrate other countries' ability to deliver that sanctions relief to Iran. So if it were a different type of agreement, you know, an arms control agreement, you know, along the lines of, say, U.S.-Soviet agreements, where everybody's um, reducing their stockpiles or something like that, that, that would be a different situation. But the nature of the agreement, I think, gives, makes it essentially a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Iran because of the U.S. power in the financial system. I would obviously agree with that and just simply say that I think it's clear to most of you that certainly in Europe, when you talk to um, the politicians, you know, all of the politicians were very critical of Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA and are, are, are doing their best to try to keep it on life support. Um, but the captains of industry, it's not that they were supportive of, of the withdrawal from the JCPOA, but they almost unanimously said that, listen, if we're, this is, we're being forced to make a simple choice. Do we want to do business with America or do we want to do business with Iran? And if their business with Iran is X, their business in America is 100X. So it was a, a pretty clear choice for, for, for most of the major uh, companies uh, around the world. I, I think the way that, um, you know, and this is something I've said to, to, to folks at the State Department because they're now trying to uh, oppose what is the, the latest thing that the special instex, yeah, instex is called um, European initiatives to keep the JCPOA on life support by fostering at least a little bit of trade and especially humanitarian trade between the US and Iran. And I've said that I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge mistake for the US government to, to oppose this because if you even oppose humanitarian or, or minimal trade, then what reason is there whatsoever for Iran to continue to adhere to the deal? And Iran putting its foot on the accelerator again and, and reconstituting its nuclear program um, is certainly not in the interest of the United States. As Mike said earlier, I think it's the Trump administration's preferred approach is to be able to have its cake and eat it too, to sanction Iran, you know, U.S. withdrawal from the agreement, but they don't want to excessively provoke Iran, so it also withdraws from the agreement. Actually, thank you. Taller than my. I think uh, first I have a comment. Uh, I think on the economic side, Iran, of course, uh, no country likes sanctions, uh, including Iran. Uh, but sanctions talk has been managed in Iran. I mean, uh, it's a very important point. Uh, I don't think that. Uh, the U.S. Uh, sanctions has the ability to really uh, reach its goals because of the Iranian economy and Iranian resilience. We have uh, different challenges. We don't uh, ignore the challenges, 
but we have also capabilities and capacities that we have uh, responded. And I have to say that the Iranian economy is a diverse economy, is uh, having a lot of venues, so we can talk on the Iranian economy. It's not just U.S. Uh, versus Iran on the economic side. But uh, beyond the comment, I have a question for both of the panelists. And that is, what extent do you put the U.S.-Iran policy in a global context? Uh, and obviously, U.S. is uh, imposing, uh, trying to impose its domestic laws globally. Uh, Europe, uh, China, Russia, it has some, of course, impact, especially for European companies. But uh, is it just for Iran or is it for a new vision for management of global affairs? Is Trump that smart to have a view of that sort, that let's finish multilateral uh, institutions, impose U.S. Uh, sanction, uh, impose U.S. will uh, on global politics? Actually, I read in New York Times a piece written by Robert Copeland. The title was, it's all about China. And the content was about uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions on Iran. Uh, was it? I mean, is it a, a strategic vision of global uh, governance by you and United States or hegemony? And if that's the case, doesn't it have its own weaknesses? Isn't it showing that the U.S. feels that, yes, its economic and financial power is so, but it's not respected, it's not accepted, and it is not what a hegemony can be? Furthermore, there is a, an, uh, a comp another component, and that is... The resistance which comes globally, I mean, China is not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, subdue to United States pressure. Uh, Russia is not going to do, even Europe. So what will you see, how, the question is how you relate this to the global perspective of United States, the sources of this global perspective, what are they? And finally, what would be the reaction of the others? And wouldn't it be a different, uh, setting that the United States expects. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, do you want to go first on that? Uh, sure, I'm happy to. Um, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Kazim. Um, so, uh, I guess I'll answer your question in two parts. One, uh, about the extraterritoriality or the extraterritorial application of American sanctions. Um, look, this is obviously a point of dispute and sort of uh, a sore point between the U.S. and largely the rest of the world because, um, as Kareem was mentioning, it, it's not accepted, I would say, by other governments that the U.S. enforces sanctions extraterritorially um, around the world, but, uh, but it, the, the way these sanctions work is through markets and through the private sector. And so the private sector um, will make its own decision about whether to respect the U.S. sanctions because of the global nature of uh, commerce. Um, and so, in a sense, it's not the, the reaction of other governments um, is significant, but it's significant more diplomatically than it is for the actual success of the sanctions. Um, one question I think that we need to ask, though, is whether that will be true in perpetuity, um, whether, whether there will be any more effective um, responses from other states um, to try to curtail uh, American financial power and what impact or consequences that could have broadly uh, for these types of issues. Um, I would say if, if we're going to see that reaction, it probably won't be over Iran because ultimately um, Iran is a small market for most of the countries which are involved. I'll also say that you see this phenomenon not just from the United States, in my opinion, you see this um, from other countries as well. So you see efforts, for example, by China to have an impact on the decisions of private sector actors outside of its borders, basically in exchange for access to the Chinese market. Um, and frankly, you see similar steps by the EU uh, through things like GDPR and so forth. You know, this idea that in order to access our market, you must comply with our laws even in your activities outside of our boundaries. I think it is, in a sense, a function of the interconnectedness uh, of the commercial world uh, these days. And it's bound to bring us into uh, conflict both with adversaries and allies um, to some extent. Um, when it comes to you know, other countries and their compliance and their resistance and so forth, 
So far, frankly, we haven't seen a lot of it. We haven't seen concerted efforts to resist or stand up to U.S. sanctions. Um, as I said, I think the risk will be a systemic one. As you apply sanctions that are comprehensive to more and more countries, as you use this tool more broadly, um, you sort of end up creating a large portion of the world which is cut off from the American financial system and which you know, may decide to um, you know, trade with each other uh, and have its own financial system. And I'm not sure that we have fully looked into or comprehended what the consequences will be. Um, the other, I think, issue is uh, trying to operate these policies in reverse. One thing that we saw, I would argue, um, with the JCPOA was a degree of overpromising by both the U.S. and Iran. Um, one of the challenges the U.S. had under President Obama was that because these sanctions that we put in place were market-based sanctions and relied upon the decisions of commercial uh, private sector actors, lifting those sanctions also relied on the decisions of those private sector actors. So it wasn't something it turned out the U.S. could simply do by fiat, by government decision. Um, private sector actors, even when the U.S. sanctions were lifted, said, we still think Iran is too risky a market in which to do business. And that made it hard to deliver on sanctions. I imagine that would be true in many different circumstances, Russia, North Korea, uh, even China, uh, and so forth. And so it's a tool that is um, one which I would say is still very much sort of under development and we're still under understanding its consequences. Um, that said, I think it's um, uh, still for the United States a tremendously powerful tool and one which ends up having bipartisan support in the United States. One thing that you hear about Trump's Iran policy, President Trump's Iran policy, is even from critics uh, of that policy, a, a level of surprise at how effective American sanctions have been uh, in isolating Iran's economy. Um, and so I think it will be a policy or a tool that you see used uh, in the future in all sorts of different contexts. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd say is that, uh, Ambassador Sajipur, that one of the unfortunate things about not having official relations between the U.S. and Iran is, you know, you don't have an opportunity to come to Washington and talk to people. And I think maybe Secretary Armitage could attest to this as well, that it's, I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone, whether they're at the Pentagon, CIA, Congress, or State Department, that thinks the adversarial relationship between the U.S. and Iran is beneficial for U.S. national interests. Uh, almost... Everyone you will talk to universally will say that we would welcome uh, a better relationship with Iran. It is in no way in U.S. interest to keep Iran isolated and backward and, 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 and sanctioned. Um, kind of the, the caricature view that many Iranian revolutionaries, the anti-imperialists had um, four decades ago. But I think it's very difficult uh, to make amends with a group of folks who feel like they need the United States as an adversary for their own internal legitimacy in Iran. And as I think Mayor said earlier, if there was ever a case study which tested America's ability to make peace with Iran, I think it was the eight years of the Obama administration. Who, you know, Obama wrote multiple letters to the Supreme Leader, John Kerry, who's now my colleague at Carnegie. I think he would have loved to go to Tehran had he been invited. He probably spent more time talking to foreign ministers at ETH than anyone, anyone else. So on the, on the plane ride over here, I was reading um, uh, one of uh, Lee Kuan Yew's books, and he said that um, he was asked which individual he most admired, and he said Deng Xiaoping. And he was asked why, and he said, well, Deng Xiaoping uh, took a very difficult decision, which was he, he decided to put China's interests before its ideology, and they avoided the fate of the Soviet Union for that reason. And I think many American officials for many years have been waiting for uh, an Iranian official that could take that very difficult decision like Deng Xiaoping to kind of put aside the, the ideology of 1979 and, and, and to look forward. And, and that's not excusing you know, President Trump's current approach, but it's just to say that if there's any country which, in my opinion, benefits from the status quo and an isolated Iran, it's Russia. I think Russia, this is, a, is an anomaly that America, and it's an historic anomaly that America and Iran are adversaries, and Russia and Iran are allies, because Russia is the one country which I would argue really benefits from Iran's isolation and the fact that Iran can't exploit its mass, massive reserves of natural gas and compete 
with, uh, with, with uh, 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 Russia and European gas markets. And I think the Russians also understand that, you know, were there to be a, a U.S.-Iran rapprochement, Iran would far, be far less reliant on, 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 on Russia. And so um, what I said in, in, with regards to your first comment, which was about economic sanctions, um, I think that's right, that Iran has shown uh, an ability to withstand outside pressure and, and sanctions. I guess it's just a question of, you know, what are the aspirations of Iranians in the first decade of the revolution? You could subject your population to that type of hardship because there was still a revolutionary fervor and people maybe were willing to, to endure. Um, but I think as... as, as, as my friends and, and family in Iran would argue that you know people are are not that's not their aspiration to simply endure uh, economic sanctions. They have much greater aspirations for Iran. And I was looking back at the speeches of the leader um, before he gave his speech about heroic flexibility, which was kind of a, a preface to the nuclear negotiations, which led to the JCPOA. And I noticed that he. In almost every speech before the heroic flexibility speech, he was extremely defiant and said, we are, are going to continue to resist. We're not going to relent. And then abruptly came the speech about heroic flexibility. And, and I think that, um, um, you know, as I said, there's valid reasons for him to continue to resist. But, but I, I don't take it for granted that, you, that all 80 million Iranians support uh, the approach of resistance. I think that people, they may not like the Trump administration, but I think very few people like living in the status quo context now in Iran. Thank you. Who else can I give the floor? I've got Ellen over here and then this gentleman. Hi, good afternoon. Ellie Geremeyer from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I had several questions to Mike first. Um, looking around the corner to 2020 elections, if um, we were to be faced with a Trump second term, how do you see the US administration building the alliances that you were talking about, particularly with the European countries? Because one of the things that was predicted was that as Iran begins to test Europeans on both the JCPOA and on regional security, they would be more persuaded to join the maximum pressure campaign. Now, for now, that doesn't bother UK, seem to be happening. Um, but how do you see these alliances being built by the Trump administration should it secure a second term? Um, and a, um, a second question for you. As um, this escalation continues uh, from the Iranian side in response to um, the, the no waivers and, and zero oil export policy from the, of the United States, if at one point Iran were to cross the president's red lines, which we don't really know what that is, um, what do you think the response would be and to what ends um, from, from this administration? Um, and a question for Karim, if we were to be faced with a Democrat president um, in 2021, do you think the situation would be fundamentally different for Tehran? Um, because from all of the game scenarios that I've been involved with, it seems very difficult, even under a Democrat president, for Iran and the U.S. to, to simply uh, press um, the restart button, um, and it's going to take a lot of diplomatic effort. Thank you. Shitoshi uh, Tanaka, former deputy for minister of Japan. Uh, I would like to pose questions regarding a uh, call by uh, President uh, Trump and also the military establishment of the United States for the coalition uh, of willing nations to protect the uh, tankers. Uh, do you expect great many countries will join in it? And if not, if not, there is going to be further damage on the credibility of the United States, which I would like to avoid. What is the right course of actions for soft landing? If there were to be great many countries to join in this project, that's fine. But I don't expect that to happen. If so, what is the alternative scenario 
in order to protect U.S. credibility. Thank you. The question to me from Ellie was, um, if a democratic administration, uh, if, if a Democrat wins, you know, what are the possibilities for the relationship? I think to some extent, you could argue, depends on which, which Democrat. Um, you know, I think for the most part, almost every Democratic candidate has said that um, they would return to the JCPOA, and some have been much more enthusiastic about it. For example, Bernie Sanders. This is a kind of a tangential point, but what one of the debates I've seen amongst the Democrats on foreign policy is this argument between those who believe that the United States should be tougher on its allies and those who believe we should be tougher on our uh, uh, adversaries. I think Bernie Sanders is case in point that when you listen to him speak, he's far more critical about US allies like Saudi Arabia and Israel than he is US adversaries. Um, and when I, I talk to advisors to Sanders, one of the things that they say is that uh, we should be more critical, U.S. should be more critical about allies and adversaries because we have leverage over our allies in a way that we don't over our adversaries. But so let's say a Democrat is elected and they vow to go back to JCPOA. I think there's a, there's a couple points. One is um, I think many have recognized that it's not simply enough to say let's go back to status quo ante because some of the clauses of the JCPOA will soon be expiring. So the language they talk about is about a JCPOA 2.0, something which, um, you know, which could be um, um, renegotiated in, in, in longer term. Um, but I fundamentally am, am not optimistic that even if you have a Democratic president who um, who is committed to improving the relationship between the United States and Iran, that we're going to be able to get over the obstacles, which is um, what I said to Ambassador Sajidpour earlier, that in my opinion, you still have a system in Iran which feels that it needs, uh, um, it, it needs the United States as an enemy for its own internal legitimacy, and they fear that our rapprochement with the United States would would uh, be more of an existential threat than continued contained animosity. And as long as Iran's, one of Iran's official slogans remains death to Israel, I think it's gonna be very difficult for members of Congress um, to, to, to support a, a much bolder US approach towards Iran because that's an issue that you know, for members of Congress, they obviously feel very strongly about. So I, I think that if we weren't able to reach a rapprochement under Obama and Kerry, um, it's going to be difficult even in a, if the next administration is democratic, as long as this current supreme leader remains in power. So um, on the question of how can we build alliances with European partners, uh, and for that matter, other partners uh, on Iran, I, I think in the... In the past, my advice to the Trump administration had been try to reach a modus vivendi on the JCPOA, agree to disagree uh, to some extent, and focus on those issues where there is agreement and try to find um, sort of collective action that you can take on those issues, the, the missile issue, regional issues, terrorism, and so forth. I think we're beyond that now. Um, and now I think that if there's going to be unity of purpose between the United States and our allies, it will be because of the actions that Iran takes. And so if we see more nuclear escalation, regional escalation from Iran, even those countries that might prefer uh, to see the JCPOA to survive will decide that they have little choice but to uh, join the United States. Um, when it comes to um, the question of red lines, I think in a sense we saw, I think it was on June 20th, what might happen if Iran were to cross President Trump's red lines, whatever those red lines might be. We came very close, I think, to a U.S. strike on Iran. Um, and I think that would probably be President Trump's response if he felt those red lines had been crossed. Um, when it comes to the question uh, from Tanaka-san about the coalition of the willing to protect shipping uh, in the Strait of Hormuz, the Arabian Sea, and so forth, Look, I, th I think there are two big obstacles to recruiting partners for this mission um, and, one, and reasons that we haven't yet seen great uptake from partners on this mission. Number one, uh, I think that many partners believe that 
the solution to the instability in the Gulf really lies between the U.S. and Iran, not, not in their hands, um, because they view this as an extension of uh, the U.S.-Iran clash over the JCPOA. Um, and therefore, the solution lies somehow in the U.S. and Iran compromising with each other, not in uh, necessarily steps that, that these countries themselves can take. Um, this is why I say that, in a sense, these are the types of policies that would have made, been very smart to try to take two years ago before withdrawing from the JCPOA um, to create a sort of uh, different regional conditions. Second, and I think this gets a little bit less play, but is equally important, um, there is a sense that right now the U.S. is not consistent in our policies. If you look at, for example, uh, our decision, President Trump's tweet about withdrawing from Syria, um, it's, I think, underappreciated in the United States that this then leaves allies holding the bag, as it were, um, for decisions they've taken to support us. And so we, would, we need to give allies the kind of comfort and assurance that if they were to sign up for this mission with us, sending their forces into harm's way, um, taking some risks in their regional relationships, with Iran especially, that there won't be a tweet or a sort of statement tomorrow that reverses American policy. Um, and the way that I would say President Trump has talked about this issue, saying, you know, these tanker attacks are not that important, it's really up to other countries to deal with it, hasn't provided that assurance that if other countries do sign up, the U.S. will um, be consistent, be reliable, and be predictable in that way. And that's really what the bedrock of any alliance is, is that reliability. Thank you. We've got time for, I think, one last round of questions. Anthony, and I, yeah, I see one over there. <clears throat> Uh, Karim, uh, your answer as to if the next president is a Democrat, what the reaction would be? I think one would have to answer Ambassador Sadat's post question, the issue of confusion. See, during JCPOA, when Obama was doing it, the Senate wrote a letter to the governing council in Iran. Don't deal with this Obama, because when we come to power, we will disavow it, which they did. So you have an issue of confusion. How do you address that from the Iranian point of view? Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry. I think I have more of a commentary rather than a question, but uh, I think it matters. Keep it very brief, I, I'll try. I think it matters in terms of in terms of how we perceive the situation. And I wanted to since since the beginning um, at this conference, I was supposed to cover actually a Russian perspective on uh, the crisis. I wanted to disagree with Dr. Sajadpur what he just said about that Russia is the most benefiting actor in this. I, I think it's a little bit redundant and too simplistic and we become, we fall victim of stereotypes in here because uh, as you remember, Russia was among those and probably at the forefront of those lobbying uh, and uh, lobbying the agreement and uh, partially GCPOA is actually based based on uh, the plan suggested by Minister Lavrov, uh, the step-by-step -step one. And uh, it, it's always been uh, supportive of uh, the outcome of the negotiations. Um, about oil uh, and gas supplies and that Iran can become uh, a competitor to Russia, actually Russian experts don't look at it like this uh, because everybody sees that it, it will take Iran a long time to become a real competitor. And of course Russia has been doing something in, in an attempt to diversify and to redirect Iranian supplies elsewhere, and that's why it was um, that was one of the reasons why it was uh, financing the Pakistani side of this Iran Pakistan India um, um, uh, gas pipe. And now, uh, if you probably know, uh, they have another already. 2.0 project of that, and Russia again participating in that in an attempt to diversify their supplies and to redirect them from uh, uh, its traditional supply routes. Uh, but uh, I think when you look at this, it, uh, look at this this way, it looks like Russia is trying to do something to undermine GCPA, or at least just sit. Uh, stay back and uh, do nothing about that. That's a, that's not true. That's true that Iranians say that the ball now is at the um, European side because I think Russia reached its limit in how uh, 
it can apply its uh, diplomatic effort and uh, how it can help Iran financially. We have this uh, swap for goods deal, which is still ongoing. Um, so I think the real question is that, are Europeans ready to do something? And um, certainly Iran and Russia are taking um, a kind of joy in um, standing as a resistance against the America-based um, international order and America-based order on Iran, uh, as opposite to the rules-based, the one that we often talk about, and even I think Mr. Shanahan uh, just recently was here and he spoke of it a lot here at Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. Uh, they take certain joy in that. But um, my question is, are Europeans ready to do something? And is it possible? Because as Dr. Singh just said, that uh, it's practically a bilateral deal JCP was a bilateral deal between Iran and uh, uh, the United States. And without a change at that front, are we able to do something else? Because we also, uh, by we, I mean Russia here, we reached our limit. Thank you. So, uh, as to Anthony's question, um, look, I, I think that partisanship in foreign policy in the United States isn't new, but I would say, from my perspective, it has, it's getting worse. Um, and I do fault, in this sense, the Obama administration uh, in that there were clear sort of divisions within uh, the U.S. political establishment over the JCPOA. Um, and I don't think there was um, a serious effort to try to bridge those divides in comparison to um, previous foreign policy initiatives. For, so, for example, on Libya, um, uh, as Secretary Armitage will remember, on Libya, there was a real intense effort to kind of bring along Congress, even individual members of Congress, who had concerns about the deal that was being done with Gaddafi. Um, and, and you could sort of maybe point to other episodes like that in the past. So my concern is that increasingly, instead, the United States, uh, what you're seeing is um, Republicans or Democrats are, are using things like, you know, UN Security Council um, uh, adoption in President Obama's case, um, you know, sort of the, the support of allies in President Trump's case in the Middle East, like Israel and Saudi Arabia, as almost sort of tools in this kind of partisan fight within the United States. My own view is that um, as in any negotiation, you have a negotiation with the other side, but then you often have a negotiation sort of within your side. Um, and that, in a way, is the more important part of the negotiation. You have to have your side on board, or at least a sufficient coalition on your side, um, so that the deal can be sustained. Hopefully, whoever is president next um, will take that approach. We'll sort of first get our side on board with an approach um, before trying to make a deal with the other side. Otherwise, you know, we'll be going through these cycles of, you know, deal, no deal indefinitely, I would say. Um, on the, the point about Russia, I'll just, and, and Europe, I'll just throw in my two cents very briefly, which is, I, I do think that, in a sense, the current situation is beneficial for Russia, in the sense that I think that, I think uh, the MEI put out um, a, a paper which I was just looking at about uh, a new northern tier strategy uh, or something like that. I do think that Ru one of Russia's goals is to prevent the United States from kind of reforming any kind of northern tier alliance. Uh, and you see a lot of Russian attention to Turkey, to Afghanistan, you know, to those countries which are in the sort of near south of Russia. Iran is in a sense the easy one because there's no prospect right now of any kind of U.S.-Iran rapprochement. Uh, and so I think this situation sort of serves Russian interests just fine. One question that I think we need to ask as American policymakers is how does Russia's seemingly new willingness to project power abroad affect American options vis-a-vis -vis Iran? So if you had, for example, this, con this um, uh, sort of contingency that we were just talking about of military conflict between the U.S. and Iran, what role would Russia play? I don't know the answer. Maybe, Julia, you can give the answer later. Um, Europe, I think, is looking for ways and sort of mechanisms that it can offer to try to de-escalate or defuse the conflict, hence INSTEX. Uh, INSTEX I see not as a kind of significant economic vehicle, but more a ladder for Iran to climb down should it wish to um, gain some kind of symbolic victory out of the, the current um, crisis, which Iran has not uh, shown much interest in so far. But I think that right now is all Europe is really able to do because of what we were talking about before. Karim, I'll give you the last word. I'm very, very brief because I think I'm standing before all of you in lunch. So, uh, Anthony, I think you're absolutely right that if there is a democratic administration, what's 
uh, critical is to have clarity and realistic, uh, you know, something realistic in the Iran strategy. I think President Obama did a very good job of making clear to the Iranians the JCPOA was not about, it's not about regime change. We're not interested in uh, a, a, a regional modus vivendi. Um, this is only about non-proliferation. And I think it's important that the uh, next administration be very clear. Um, the confusion you talk about is mutual. So you're absolutely right. We have uh, a tremendous partisanship right now in Washington. And uh, at the same time, it's been always confusing for US officials in that the Iranian, the most powerful Iranian officials we don't have access to, like the Revolutionary Guards and and, um, and the Supreme Leader, and the Iranian officials we oftentimes have access to are not the most powerful. So the confusion is mutual. Uh, on, on Russia, the only thing I'd say is just to kind of repeat what Mike said, that it's fairly self-evident that Russia sees itself in strategic competition with the United States. And so therefore having Iran as a thorn in the side of the United States is beneficial for Russia. And a rapprochement between Iran and the United States would not be beneficial to Russia. That's the basic point. Thank you.